All right, well, it's good to see everybody, and, uh, you know, kind of uh, goes without saying, we're excited to start the season. Um, you know, it's been a, uh, a long camp, um, but I thought the NCAA really made a good decision in terms of, uh, for safety reasons, you know, coming in early, giving the players a day off, only having one a days. Th this is the healthiest um, that I can ever remember a football team being through camp. And, and this is in my 18 years as a head coach and 29th year. Um, and we practiced hard and we even ended up having one more scrimmage. But right now, uh, you know, health-wise, we're in relatively good shape. I thought we had a productive camp. We got to work a lot of situations. You know, every season starts out that you, you think you have certain strengths and then maybe certain things that aren't as strong. And then as camp evolves, some of those things are confirmed and other concerns pop up and there's some pleasant surprises that you end up having maybe better depth at a position than you thought because the emergence of redshirt freshmen. But you know, all that's theory until you kick off and play a game and, uh, and that's going to happen in about 48 hours here when we play uh, open with Presbyterian. So just about Presbyterian, um, you know, they have a, a new head coach. Usually if it was one of your phones, I'd make a comment. <laughs> hey, it's, it's Dan Collins. Is it really? No. Uh. <laughs> so this press conference, is, it's definitely different without Dan. So, but, uh, you know, they have a, not really a new head coach. Coach Spangler was very, very successful there. He won two-thirds of his games. He went on. He was a very successful coordinator at Louisiana Tech, came back as a defensive coordinator. So they've basically brought back one of the most successful coaches in their program's history back to be the head coach. And um, they're uh, on offense. They're a veteran group. I think they have four starters back on the O-line. The quarterback, Cheek, is a returning starter. Uh, Watson and Davis are both dynamic receivers. Very, very challenging schematically. Uh, they run a ton of different motions. They have some really unique plays that you have to defend perimeter runs on both sides of the field at once because they have the ability uh, to bring the slot back in and really get into two and three back sets and they're lined up in a one back set. It's, it's unique, it's very much spread oriented, a lot of misdirection and it's one of those defenses or offenses that really challenge your defense from an assignment standpoint. Um, that we've got to be on our checks and know our assignments and if not you know, something can pop quickly. Uh, defensively, you know, they're, they're new up front, but a very veteran group in the secondary and a very good secondary. Um, and, and I say this every time we play an FCS team, if there's any coach in the country that should have respect for FCS football, it's me. You know, I was a head coach at that level for nine years. And certainly when you're at that level and you play these games, whatever you see on film is going to be better. They're going to be up for it. It's an opener. Um, you know, this is an opportunity they have on a big stage, uh, but we tell our team all the time that we have to focus on our preparation, uh, the consistency of our performance, doesn't matter who we play. We've just got to make sure the best that Wake Forest can be shows up each and every week. And that's a challenge through any season, uh, you know, especially through 12 games, but that all starts for us Thursday. So, you know, all those emotions with an opener, excitement, anxiety, nervousness, um, you know, game ones are always, to me, mistake-driven games. Um, that's why there's so many upsets early in the year that, you know, turnovers, special teams errors, substitutions errors, you know, you, you got to go out there game one and not beat yourself. Um, and it's the first time that this foot, the 2017 team has played together. Um, you know, we, we have some experience back, but we're missing some real key pieces from a year ago. And it's going to be critical that guys step up early in the season um, and, you know, get ready for the ACC season that starts a week later. So, uh, again, game one, big game, and, and we're ready to go. Dan usually asks the first question, so I don't know if anyone... Well, one of the things I'm, I'm curious about is, is I saw you walk through, like, the start of game preparation with your squad during mm -hmm. the last uh, practices of the spring kind of fall camp. You've got a lot of new coaches, though, too, now. How do you get them prepared to how the Deeks get prepared for a game on game day? How do they figure all that out on the fly? It's not on the fly. I mean, we, we have had to spend, uh, you know, I've, I've basically had, I had the same staff for, you know, almost a decade. 
same offensive coordinator, defense coordinator, special teams coordinator, and now there's four new faces in that room, and we have had to spend a lot more time in staff meetings going over that stuff with the staff so they know how we operate. This is what we do pre-game. This is what we do pre-practice. This is what our walkthroughs look like. This is what this meeting should look like. This is what our uh, scripted scrimmage looks like. Um, and you know, there's a way that we do things that, that I believe in, um, that I have found to be successful in the places I've been. Um, I always love getting new ideas. You know, there's, there's wrinkles that maybe Jay brought from Minnesota working with Coach Kill or Wayne brought from Virginia when he was with Coach Grow or Connecticut. And I always love those new ideas if they enhance what we're doing. Um, but again, it, it just, it's a lot more meetings. You know, that our, our staff meetings before practice are probably 10 to 15 minutes longer than they were a year ago. You know, when you have the same coordinators for nine straight years, it's, okay, this, 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 bang, we good, yep, good. Now there's a lot more explanation. I mean, even as simple as, okay, when we go pre-practice and go specialists, this is where everybody is. This is your space on the field. This is where you should be when the whistle blows. That way we're not wasting time with the players. You mentioned in your opening comments that you felt that the fall camp had showed you some added depth at some positions that you weren't aware of going into camp. What, what are those positions and who added the depth? Well, I, I think at running back, um, I'm, I'm really pleased with the camp Arkeem Bird had. You know, that you go into it knowing what a year ago Cade Carney and Matt Colburn did, believing that a year older, a year more experienced, another year in the weight room, they're going to be better. And you wanted a third guy to emerge. And uh, Arkeem Bird had a really good camp. And Christian Beal at some point may factor in there. He would be a guy that we'd consider red alert right now, that we would love to redshirt him. Um, but if we have an injury, then we're going to get Christian ready to play. Um, certainly at tight end, Jack Frudenthal had a really good camp. He has now become a playable tight end for us. Um, our receiver depth is the best it's been in my time here. I think our quarterback depth is the best it's been. Um, I'm really pleased with how our corners have developed. I think that might be the most improved position on our team uh, from spring until camp. Now they've got to play in a game, but I thought uh, Amari Henderson really improved, Asang Bassey improved. Uh, Jasir Taylor, I think, has a bright future. And, uh, you know, we just got to get Cedric Giles going. You know, so that position leaving spring, which I thought would be really thin, you know, now has some depth and some guys that can play. And all those things help you on special teams. Um, you know, DJ Taylor as a linebacker. Uh, Nate Mays had a good camp. So all those guys now become playable. They become in a rotation. They allow you to use Grant Dawson on more special teams. And all those things make your football team better. We were talking to John Walford about last year, what he took from it, what, what, what's, how the team handled last year with all the rumors that went down, and ultimately the success you had at the end. What have you told your team about last year? Is that just in the past? You know, it, every year is a new year. Every team's a different team. It has new leadership. There's certainly lessons we learned from a year ago. I, I thought uh, the persistency of last year's team, um, their ability to block things out. I mean, we were part of a national story for over a month. And I don't think that ever or rarely got talked about within our walls or within our locker room. And I, I really thought last year's team did a good job of blocking out the noise. You know, that could have really taken over and crumbled from within, but the team didn't let that happen. And so I think there were great examples of leadership last year on that football team, whether it be you know, Ryan Javion or Markel Lee and Ty Hayworth. All those guys stepped up and had their best year as fourth and fifth year seniors. Um, and so uh, I, I just think you, know, you don't get too up, you don't get too down. It's a long season. Uh, how you practice matters, how you prepare matters, control the controllables. And uh, if you do that, you know, there's going to be adversity that hits, but if you control the controllables, you're best prepared for it. It's kind of really testing those theories, too, because ultimately the things you don't count on happening are during games or competition. This thing's totally out of left field. Mm -hmm. And all the things that you talked about tested probably in a way you never thought would be. Yeah, it was challenging, but 
I, I think winning that last game, really, we, we've tried to put it in the rearview mirror. The press won't let us. And again, I get that it's your job to ask those questions, so I don't take, you know, I don't take that question the wrong way. But within our program, uh, other than the fact that we now close practice, it's nothing has changed. We don't talk about it. It's over with. It was handled, and we're moving forward. So was that last game, that ball game, was that maybe the biggest game of the year for all those reasons? You, you know, you go back and. It's hard to ever say, you know, at the time, every game feels like the biggest game. When we, you know, beat Duke at Duke week two, I mean, we got off to a, a bad, you know, we played poorly the first week at Tulane, and that first half didn't start out well. And, you know, just the way winning that game was a big confidence shot, and going to Indiana and beating them and finding a way to beat Virginia. And if you take away any of those games, the, the bowl game never happens. So, you know, whatever game you play, that is the biggest game. Um, what was what finally pushed uh, John Wolford over the top to be, be named the starting quarterback for Presbyterian? And do you have any plan to use both of those guys, and and how do they take the, the results of this? Well, I just you know it was a matter of I thought John won the job. I don't think Kendall lost it. John just played exceptionally well all camp, very consistent, and in the scrimmages. Um, played better. Move, he moved the ball better. Um, we both give him reps with the ones now. Um, we're not going into it with any preset rotation, uh, but John's a starter. He should not be looking over his shoulder. We'll let him play through things. You know, we would love to have the opportunity to get Kendall in there. Uh, how and when that happens, I'm not sure. And if I did know, I wouldn't tell you. And how, 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 how did both the guys accept the news? Um, obviously, John was excited, and I thought Kendall handled it very maturely. You know, that Kendall is aware that because of last year being a red shirt, if, if they were in the same class or one year separation, you know, there's two years of separation, he knows that he needs to keep getting better and he needs to develop because his time is going to come. And whether that's game one, game five, or who knows when. I just keep going back to what I've said all the time. Uh, those two have not shown the ability to stay healthy. I hope this is the year they both stay healthy. But if history is any uh, indication, you know, at some point we're going to need Kendall. And who knows, that could be the second series. Last year, Kendall becomes a starter. And first quarter, Delaware, he goes down. And if John had hung his head and didn't prepare, then we don't go to a bowl. So both of those guys have to prepare like they're going to play. Is there anything John could do, could have done, or has done over the spring and the summer to, to maybe help himself stay healthy through the season? And do you think he's done those things? He's done those things. I think he's in the, the training room a lot more. Um, you know, he's had nagging things. And if you wait till those nagging things come up to treat him, it's probably too late. So he's been very proactive. And as I said in my opening statement, I thought the way training camp was this year was great. Again, the NCAA gets a lot of criticism. Um, you know, some of it may be fair, some of it unfair. Whatever doctors, people came up with this model for a training camp, I thought was great. If you really care about student athlete uh, health and safety, this camp and our players loved it. Now, you can't serve two masters. You know, you can't do that and also say, geez, we got to give the players more time off. You know what I'm saying? That you couldn't. You had to come in earlier to do this camp model. And I think our players would tell you the trade-off was worth it. There might be other players in other programs that didn't. But there's no doubt in my mind that eliminating doubles, giving the players a day off a week, uh, was best for their health, safety, welfare, physically. And because of that now, we have a healthier football team. What question marks on defense do you hope you get answered on your team over the first couple weeks of the season? Well, I mean, Zeke Rodney hasn't played football in over a year. So he's a good player. He's played well in camp, but he hasn't played in the game since 2015. Uh, you know, I, 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 defensive line, I feel we, we've got good depth there. Um, you know, we're going to play some younger linebackers. Justin Stranod's going to play more. Nate Mays is going to play more. Um, Jaquez Williams is going to play more. You always wonder how those guys do when the lights go on and they're keeping score. Um, 
you know, we're going to play some young guys in the secondary. I mean, we're going to get Kobe Davis out there and Jasir Taylor. You know, is it just normal stuff? How do freshmen react, redshirt freshmen react when they're playing for the first time? I guess how some of those uh, young linebackers and, and secondary guys play early in the season will dictate what kind of chance they get later in the season probably, right? Absolutely. I've always taken the approach with the first three to four games as you try to play a bunch of people. On defense, we've always tried to play somewhere between 18 and 20 people, at least 15 snaps a game the first four games. And you give opportunity for players to develop and show they can play in games. And if they do it, their numbers go up. If they don't do it, their numbers go down. So we'll, we'll uh, roll guys in there and give guys opportunity to play and see if they can do it in a game and execute at a high level and know what they're doing. And if they do it, their rep count goes up. You mentioned the new faces on your staff. Will we see a different Wake Forest team this year? I mean, is it going to be markedly different from what we've seen the last few years? Um, I mean, I think every year is different. I think we were different last year than 15, and I mean, that's the beauty of college football is we don't get, you know, we don't sign guys to long-term contracts. You know, every year it seems like once we get them right, then they leave. <laughs> so, um, you know, last year's defense evolved. Last year's offense changed. Um, last year we, we took a very, very conservative approach on offense because you know, our offensive line, I thought, got better. We finally had a couple of running backs we felt given the ball to. Uh, our quarterback wasn't healthy, and we played really, really well on defense. We didn't have a lot of depth on defense, so we didn't want to play with a ton of tempo and have those guys play 80, 90 snaps a game. Now we got healthy for the Temple game and felt that, that game we could go tempo and we could put a little bit more stress on them. So every year is different. How we play the game every year is going to change. Um, but the formula last year was to be very conservative in offense, run the ball, don't turn it over, don't give our defense bad field position, believing that our defense was good enough to, to get us to a bowl game. You know, I doubt if that same formula will play out exactly this year. But it might. You don't know. I mean, that's no preseason games. We haven't had a chance to test it.